Namaste. Now, I must say, we have probably all heard the cliché about onomatopoeia, that it makes music to my ears. As with other clichés, such as free with purchase, people simply ignore this concept when expressed, or such as with when a tree falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Another common conundrum. Too often the preferably ignorant come to a false conclusion prematurely and accept their own personal philosophy as being universally true. So the question, what if there is no such thing as bad music, only different genres of music appealing to different tastes among a variety of different types of audience members, is not widely considered now. If there is no bad music, then there is no good music either, and each note of every song becomes relative to the sum total of all music as to what it reflects quantitatively, but there can be no hope for a both honest and accurate assessment of any music's real quality from our ultimately infinitely unique and collectively subjective points of view. So what is music to our ears, if not merely what we find most aesthetically pleasing to listen to, and that which we would prefer were audible to us most? And if music theory is based on purely personally unique aesthetic tastes, then we must level our search for its meaning down to the scale of pattern recognition, a skill most human beings learn in early infancy. In short, when we see a shape that fits, it causes us to feel pleasure. Likewise, with how our ears have been tuned to the tones of modern scales of music, expressed mathematically as a needlessly complex series of integer ratios of sound wave pitch. One of the sound shapes our minds are most frequently attuned to is that of the nautilus shell, expressed as the Pythagorean phi or Fibonacci spiral. So what is it that attracts the mind to the shape of the Pythagorean or Phi spiral? Here we see a left-handed Phi spiral that revolves around a central origin point in an expanding counterclockwise direction or a clockwise contracting rotation. The chambers of this nautilus shell mimicking geometric design are each one a Pythagorean theorem triangle with one right or 90 degree angle. The original triangle at the core is a Pythagorean triangle formed of the abstract numbers 1, 1, and the square root of 2. A very particular Pythagorean triangle over which there has been much historical contention among the cult of Pythagoreans. The Pythagorean triangle is usually rendered with sides of 3, 4, and 5. However, because the same theorem used to de derive these measures the Pythagorean theorem itself may be applied to solve for the lengths of any triangle with one of its three interior angles being a right or 90 degree corner. The triangle formed by bisecting a unit square diagonally may also be solved in this manner and thus 1 squared plus 1 squared equals the square root of 2 squared, or, more simply, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Because the square root of 2 squared equals 2, 
then 1 plus 1 equals 2 fulfills the Pythagorean theorem in an exceptional way by cheating. The result of its doing so forms the pattern depicted here when applied across the board to all similar triangles with leg lengths measured only by one and by a square root of each next sum in numerical order. Reproducing this exceptional quality of the Pythagorean triangle of one, one, and the square root of two in this manner likewise generates a phi spiral. Inverting this image results in the right-handed phi spiral we see here, which expands clockwise and contracts counterclockwise. The method of inversion, or mere reflection symmetry, is only one of many methods to alter and approximate a perfect golden or phi spiral. The geometric method of constructing such a similar design to the natural nautilus shell shown here is actually a less common, and thus less exact, means of approximating the proper and actual phi spiral shape itself. The more common, and thus that seen as more exact, method of depicting the phi spiral as being like that of the nautilus shell is the Fibonacci spiral or as a series of rectangles and arcs each arranged at a ratio to the next along the spiraling pattern of these arcs into a singularity origin and zero point at 90 degree angles to one another and at the certain specific ratio of one to two-thirds defining the roughest approximation for phi as the ratio for the area of each iteration to the next adjacent to it on either side. Here we see in red outlines the exact Fibonacci spiral overlapping the similar naturally occurring pattern of growth of a nautilus shell. But again, what is it about this golden mean, this Fibonacci spiral, this phi transcendental sum, and even the Pythagorean triangle at its core, that inspires the human brain in such a way as to catch our attention, and how does such a pattern recognition object as the golden spiral relate to what strikes us, moreover, as music to our ears? What is it about our own species form of brains that results in our taste in different kinds of music? Is there a format for music we would actually all find equally appealing to each of our differing ideals? The relationship between the cartilage of the exterior spiraling pina and the interior smaller and oppositely positioned relative to clockwise and counterclockwise directions Oracle is based on an identical pattern to the rate of development from one inner organelle to the next of the various parts of the modern human brain. In other words, the shape we use to process sound waves is itself a template for how our brains evolve from one kingdom, family, genus, etc. to the next over the millions of years and how each individual's brain develops in the fetal stages of their embryonic development in utero. 
due to evolution over the millennia, it should come as no surprise. The key that unlocks the brain would be the same basic shape as a ventricle cross-section between its twin hemispheres. What we will be discussing in this next lecture is how and why the brain, the ear, and the nautilus shell have all evolved to mimic the pattern of the Fibonacci or phi spiral. The goal of studying this is to determine how and why this pattern constitutes a common average behind all our likes and dislikes of different tuning scales in music. First, we will study how the Pythagorean spiral template overlaps with the shape of the human brain. And then we will study how and why the phi spiral, like that formed of Pythagorean theorem triangles, relates to these different tuning scales in music. There is more to say, but for now, I must stay my tongue. Namaste. What we are preparing to explore is a line of reasoning comparing the human brain to a phi spiral and then comparing a phi spiral shaped timeline of universal events to both. The goal of such a model is to propose an alternative form of light cone one that is not straight up and down with a right angle between its base ellipse's centroid and its apex tip, but one that is curved instead, like the form of a nautilus shell. The representation of multidimensional forms and patterns for constructs symbolic of time as the fourth dimension itself is not new. Consider the pattern of the pendulum as it traces out a circle of infinite pivoting arcs. Once we identify these patterns occurring in nature, we may next explore what causes them to do so. Just as by applying study to the theory of epicycles, the explanation of heliocentrism was ultimately deduced, to account for the apparent retrograde motions of the nearby mobile heavenly bodies. For these reasons we, thus, decompose the perfect or ideal Fibonacci spiral from its similar, though imperfect and irreplicably unique counterparts that occur in nature, such as in any given example of the nautilus shell's general pattern of growth. The same way a nautilus-shaped shell pattern differs from an exact or perfect example of a Fibonacci spiral because it morphologically adapts to its changing environmental habitat over time as it grows and develops. So too does the neural complexity of the human brain grow and develop in each blastulating ovum as it matures in utero into an infant outward from a central origin point and relative only to the conditions of its parent womb. The development of the inner organelles of the overall brain organ occurs according to the same influence of environment and baseline guide being adherence to a phi expansion rate pattern as the Nautilus. The first cells to develop in the modern human brain 
eventually form the pineal and pituitary glands, and these form the basis of communication point between the brain and the body, motivated by its nervous system, but maintained by its endocrine system's glandular secretions in order to be able to do so. These inner organs of the brain also resemble the brain stems of mosquitoes and other types of insects that never evolve beyond this phase of neural development, and who thus maintain a hive mind connected all together into one queen. The next phase of neural sub-organ development to occur in the human brain corresponds to the reptilian brain stem's pattern and occurs in the hind brain structures of the human brain. Next is the mammalian brain, and this includes the majority of the remainder of the cerebrum being the midbrain structures in the modern human, responsible for our somatosensory system, our non automatically self sustaining life support, and five sensory systems. The final constructs of the brain, including the thalami and frontal lobes of the bicameral cerebellum of the so called forebrain are the most complex and evolve last in cerebral developmental cycles. If we compare the nautilus shell or phi spiral pattern in which the organelles of the brain evolve in a fetus in utero to a timeline depicting phases of universal development the result appears as it does here. We shall be examining this diagram in extreme detail next, but for an introductory overview, let us see first how the phases of neural complexity and development over time can form to chambers in a nautilus shell that are determined by the right or 90 degree angles of one interior rectangle to the next iteration ascending outward from its origin point core. Thus, we can trace out nine basic levels of development of the cosmos along a timeline shaped like a phi spiral, depicting such as there are nine quadrants of rotation through which the phi spiral ultimately passes from its origin point expanding outward to its end. The point inside the brain corresponding to the origin point of the phi spiral is the pineal gland, and the point inside the timeline of cosmic scale development corresponding to the origin point of the phi spiral is the Big Bang. The eighth and ninth iterations to follow from this corresponding to the midbrain and forebrain sections of cerebral development and to the realms of universal evaporation as matter decays into energy and to the subsequent nulliverse of pure ZPE energy that would logically follow such a conjecture are hypothetical. As we begin to examine this diagram more closely we quickly find the labels on it are oriented perpendicularly to our perspective on it at the arrangement's present angle. The first thing we must do is flip the diagram relative to the labels in order to be able to properly read them. To do this, we reorient its position relative to us by a 90 degree or right angle rotation counterclockwise. The phi spiral being depicted maintains its clockwise expansion rate from this point throughout the remainder of these lectures. As we move inward toward the origin point of the phi spiral pattern, let us again be reminded this association of the development of the cosmos with the pattern of a phi spiral 
is probably arbitrary. However, the association of the development of the human brain with the pattern of a phi spiral is not. And as we shall be seeing, there are apparent similarities between the brain's various tissues and the arrangements of massive quantities of stellar mass in the evolving cosmos. Let us begin our examination of this model by closing in toward the origin point from the section of the phi or Fibonacci spiral graph associated in neural development with the so-called reptilian hindbrain suborgans of the human brain. In the brain, the organelles present in this area are the cerebellum, the medulla oblongata, and the pons. In the graphic chart of the cosmos applied to the same shape, the phi spiral, we find ourselves amidst a period of universal history marked by cosmic expansion at an asymptotic rate, preceded by cosmic expansion at a series of less drastic rates, preceded by the formation of the earliest main sequence stars, preceded by the division of the four elemental forces, only one Planck time following the Big Bang. As we close in further toward this origin point of the phi spiral based combined models of the human brain and the light cone history of the cosmos, we find the origin point marking the Big Bang at the birth of our modern cosmos in the light cone model of universal time and marking the midpoint between the pineal and pituitary glands in the development of the brain stem's central core cluster of suborgans. On the chart, it is marked by the absolute value of zero. Notice at this point, there are two spirals emanating from separate origin points in this model. One spiral, marked in green in this section, is the Phi or Fibonacci spiral. The other, marked in red for now, is the regular logarithmic or pi spiral. In the cosmic scale model, the red pi spiral may symbolize space, while the green phi spiral may symbolize time, as the cosmos conditions of physics change over time between these twin spirals in this model. However, in the model of the brain, the relationship between the red pi spiral and green phi spiral is irrelevant. To begin our examination of this model in earnest, we may start by considering each aspect of the model according to quadrants, in order ascending clockwise outward. So, following the singularity of the absolute value of zero, we have the first iteration or quadrant passed through by the phi and pi spirals, and it is the first that shows them split into two separate arcs, one green, one red. The first iteration or quadrant is labeled with a Roman numeral one and occurs just to the left horizontally from the absolute value of zero at the spiral's origin. So we see the absolute value of zero breaks apart into the relative values of zero sub x below and vertical and zero sub y above and horizontal. As the singularity of absolute value zero breaks apart into the relative values of zero sub x and zero sub y, it passes through a phase of becoming a p-instanton and then undergoes the Big Bang, causing the formation of the first matter in the cosmos. 
It is here the red pi spiral measuring space begins and arcs around swiftly through the second, third, and fourth quadrant iterations to catch up again with the green phi spiral measuring time at the moment of one Planck time following the Big Bang. This additional level of the red pi spiral from the quadrant iterations labeled 1 through 5 signifies the spontaneous rapid division following the Big Bang of the four elemental forces in order clockwise from core outward, water or gravity, air or electromagnetism, fire or fission, and earth or fusion. By the fifth iteration, the cosmos had begun to form given the basic ingredients for the physics we know today. Following from quadrant iteration labeled Roman numeral 5 to the next quadrant iteration labeled Roman numeral 6, we find the twin spirals overlap and when they break this array, following iteration Roman numeral 6, the green and red color coding of the space and time, pi and Phi spirals reverses. Following the sixth iteration, expanding clockwise outward, the pi spiral is green and the phi spiral is red. The segment where they both overlap for one quadrant's arc combined as one is labeled in black as the main sequence for the formation of the earliest stars. At iteration Roman numeral 6, we find the formation of the Alpha Galaxy and the death of the first star as it was reborn to become the first black hole at the center of the Alpha Galaxy. Between the sixth iteration and quadrant iteration Roman numeral 7, is the era of nebulae forming. At the sixth iteration we also start to see another sequence of labels that will continue through to the end and these measure distance durations of that location away from our present vector of location in space-time and are labeled using the measurements of light years to this extent. The sixth iteration is labeled 10 to the seventh light years, and the seventh iteration is labeled 10 to the eighth light years, because our present vector location in spacetime is symbolized on this chart as we are in orbit around a main sequence star at iteration six, where the main sequence of stars ends and the era of nebulae begins. Further away in the distances of deep space, we can see even beyond this seventh iteration, which is marked by the end of the nebulae era and the beginning of the era of spiral galaxies. From quadrant iteration seven to quadrant iteration eight, it is the era when the majority of space is comprised of spiral galaxies, but prior to the era when these many spiral galaxies have begun to form intergalactic relativities and correspondences. From the eighth to the ninth interval, these spiral galaxies will gather together to form the intergalactic filaments, as we shall see next. Notice that this quadrant, from the seventh to the eighth iterations is correspondent also to the reptilian hindbrain in humans. The iteration from the eighth to the ninth quadrants will be equivalent to the mammalian midbrain, and the ninth to the tenth quadrant iteration will be equivalent to the human forebrain. As we shall see also, there are profound observable similarities between these models in reality. 
at the beginning of the eighth iteration on the red phi spiral symbolizing time, the simultaneity of the birth of life symbolized by DNA, and the beginning of the death of the matter energy era overall is noted only briefly, but its significance should not be overlooked. Somehow, here at iteration 8 on the spiral of time, occurs the birth of life and the original complex organisms to arise from the primordial ooze, and yet the location on this chart of our planet's location in space is nearer to iteration 6. As we shall see, our planet formed first, followed by life on it, followed by the rise of our own civilization during the era of the intergalactic filaments. The evolution of our society will be measured by a series of black arcs looping back and forth between the green pi spiral of space and the red phi spiral of time. As we shall see next, the era of intergalactic filaments in universal space corresponds between quadrant iterations 8 and 9 with the mammalian midbrain suborgans of the human brain including the aforementioned somatosensory tissues of the cerebrum's lateral lobes located just above and behind the ears which account for the majority of the processes involving the five senses the era of intergalactic filaments on a chart of cosmic scale space-time also measures the rise of human empires over the last 6,000 or so years since the agrarian revolution. By the time the spiraling cycle has reached its ninth quadrant iteration, the era of intergalactic filaments is ending, and human imperialism is already past its peak. If we intend to even live to see the cosmos as it will look like when it fully achieves this ninth iteration phase, we will have to preserve our minds as electromagnetic auras within the cosmos to persist in existing because long before such time as the end of the era of intergalactic filaments, our own planet will have met its doom. The ninth iteration we see now is, as we shall see in the next lecture, the same as the midpoint of electromagnetism, directly between its first peak, conjunctive with psi, or the mental energy harnessed by the mind, and its second peak when, at the speed of light squared, it bleeds into the force of gravity. As mentioned, we will learn more about this aspect of the arc of human activity, as it itself is based on a pattern of elemental decomposition from matter into energy. The era that follows the ninth iteration and the end of the era of intergalactic filaments is cognate to the human forebrain and the most complex neural tissues inside the human cerebral cortex. Visual likenesses have been discovered by comparing electron microscopic photographs of chemically stained neurons and synapses inside of the forebrain cerebrum and the computer graft representation of the map of the visible cosmos relating the locations of all the distant galaxies to one another along the intergalactic filament strands that connect them. The galaxies seem to act like synapses in this intergalactic neural net where the black holes at spiral galaxies cores behave like axon dendrite gaps in the nervous system where the invisible gravities forming the strands connecting these spiral galaxies along the intergalactic filaments behave like the myelin sheaths of these dendrite synapses 
and where pulses of tachyonic gravity substitute at a cosmic scale for pulses of neurotransmitters or electrochemical induction inside the brain itself. The era on the cosmic clock equivalent to the human forebrain is the era past the end of the intergalactic filament era, however, and is marked by the decomposition of these filaments and their decay into chaos and disarray until, ultimately, all matter is broken down into energy. The era between the ninth and tenth iterations on this spiral map of entropic decay from matter into zero-point energy is marked by the decline of the amount of matter, bosons with mass, in the local universe relative to the amount of energy fermions with almost no mass. As the last amounts of electromagnetism fizzle out and become gravity, the last surviving souls preserving minds as electromagnetic auras will also die out. As the period of peak gravity reigns in this era, existence, as such, is defined by shortage and scarcity. There is very little matter or space left by which to define the local universe at this phase. The mind, however, can predict conditions of fourth dimensional space that will persist, their geometries governing the future's physics even following the decline and fall of all matter in the cosmos into energy. When only ZPE remains, the tenth iteration is reached. There remain mysteries at this end of the spectrum that persist even to the minds of modern quantum astrophysicists. What lies beyond this nulliverse pure ZPE may merely prove to be a repeat of the same or a similar series of events to what we've already seen occurred and which led to us being here now. In this theory, a random quantum fluctuation within the nulliverse of unlimited ZPE or ether energy causes a singularity to collapse in upon itself, and thus from matter to be reformed from pure energy alone. At the tenth iteration, the distance between the twin spirals of space in green as pi, and time in red as phi, is at its maximum. The utmost furthest extent of the red phi spiral of time comes to an end when compared to the model of the brain inside the human head right in front of the eyes and aligns from this point to the origin point of the entire model's phi over pi spirals located at the big bang the pineal gland at the absolute value of zero, or on the map located just behind the center of the ear. So here we see the full model of the phi over pi spirals in green and red, how they overlap between the fifth and sixth iterations, how they are labeled according to a map of the universe's evolution over time, like a spiral light cone, and how they resemble the patterns of development of the portions of the human brain. When we disentangle the core wireframe skeletal diagram from its environment, displaying its similarities to the developmental phases of the human brain and to the phi spiral of the nautilus shell, the phi over pi light cone model for showing the evolution of the local universe over its entire lifetime remains. 
In this arrangement, it is easier to distinguish the sequence of black arcs between the 8th and 10th iterations of the green pi or space spiral and the red phi or time spiral. This sequence of arcs governs not only humanity's materialistic rise and fall, but also signifies our only course if we hope to live on beyond the death of Earth. This series of arcs, deceptively simple as they are, shows us how humanity as a species of life form negentropically made of matter inside a cosmos entropically decaying from matter into energy is merely riding a wave of entropic decay as the elemental forces reverse their original order of formation following the Big Bang and slowly evaporate one by one in the opposite order they originally formed. Let us look at the cosmological cycle that underlies the human social cycle's rise and fall of empires over the few aeons of our own human history. We see it consists of six arcs occurring as continuous segments of one cycle of force transference from one elemental force to the next. Each arc carries a force from left to right on this graph at a certain rate dependent on its distance from a central core origin point that occurs opposite each arc. So here we see that in the time it would take matter, the bosons produced by fusion, to travel a distance of three equal units on the bottom ruler, mind, mental energy, or the force of psi, could have traveled six units of equivalent distance, and gravity, operating at a rate of c squared in the form of superluminal tachyons, would have gotten 15 such units. The reason for the oscillation of the arc's core origin points between entropic toward the bottom or negentropic toward the top remains unknown. Without adding a more complex terrain for environmental context, the motions seen in the series of six arcs equivalent to the four elemental forces in reverse order from their split at one Planck time following the Big Bang, including also Psi, the fifth elemental force of the sixth sense, mind, and ZPE, the nulliverse at the end of time, cannot be so easily explained. If they are seen in a larger context of various other barriers and forms of impediment, then they become the obvious path of least resistance within such a model, and then their behaviors become rational and explicable. What we are seeing in this diagram is the individual, below, divided by the bicameral, or dual hemispheric nature of their own brains to seek balance and solution to this condition by rearranging material reality to suit their own goals. To accomplish this, they enter into the bargaining strategies necessary to survive economic exchange with pre extend society as a whole. Within the core of this entire social value system arises the same pattern as we find expressing the four elemental forces in reverse sequence as they appeared, plus mind and ZPE. In this manner, we see that the rise and fall of human societies has been only a phenomenon we've experienced while floating on the surface of a larger pattern, consisting of a much longer term trend for influence on a much larger cosmic scale 
and that if we continue on in this trend as we are now, we may yet be able to outlive Earth, but we could not survive the death of the material cosmos itself. Here, we see a measurement system that uses a multiple origin point method, a multicentroid graph, or combined horizontal vertical slide rule, to measure the values, both absolute, denoted by bar, value bar, and relative, denoted by parenthesis, value, comma, value, parenthesis, of various variables. The values ascribed to the variables, such as plus or minus and integer values, relate to the variable's distance from the primary vertical axis at a right angle to the horizontal midpoint. The structure is here applied to measuring the values of variables x and y, where the values given for one occur from the perspective or from the POV of the other. Thus, for example, the value on the middle left, y equals negative 3, denotes the value of y from the point of view of x is negative 3. In this arrangement we see that x is the individual and y the group or collective of any given society or culture of the same species as x. Thus the middle vertical axis measures the minimum values of x to y and of y to x, and the further from this, the greater their perceived values become. The top arc above the middle axis line is symbolic of the free market of exchange between the individual and the society or group, and constitutes a graphic depiction of our elevated, though arbitrary, overinflated valuation of imaginary commodities in this realm where the very currency of exchange itself is fake. Below the horizontal axis line are the mind states of those individuals more prone toward an individual mindset perspective or POV on the left and those more prone to a collectivist mindset, perspective, or POV on the right. The measure at the lower middle symbolizes the absolute value of reality as being comprised of twin halves, one the perspective of the individual, labeled X, the other that of the collective, society, or group, labeled Y. Moving toward the central most core of the model, we find the horizontal axis line symbolic of the perception between the individual, either of an independent or collectivist mindset below and the realm of social discourse above. We see the motivation for the independent individual to initiate the process of interacting with the exterior realm of society is needs and the comparable force motivating the collectivist individual is manufacture. What one person needs, another can make, and what one person makes, another may need, such as society to the individual. As we delve into the utmost central depths at the core of the model, we find the mechanism of exchange between the interior individual and the exterior society. It is comprised of subjective knowledge in the semicircle on the left and 
supposedly, objective good and evil in the square on the right. As knowledge originating from the future, labeled F for future, increases, following the path of logic, labeled PR for present, options decrease into memory, labeled PA for past. Such is considered the subjective aspect of the independent individual, labeled psi of Y. The objective aspect of the collectivist individual, labeled psi of X, is comprised of morality leading one toward their destiny, labeled NAM, while their independent individual will leads them away from this end. Now let us examine each quadrant in the same detail we have now covered for the core of the model. As we move toward the lower right corner, we see more of the objective nature of good and evil, expressed as the opposition of morality and will. We see that karma motivates toward the will, while conflict motivates toward morality. From the point of view of X, or the independent individual, the objective aspect of the collectivist individual, Y, is evil, but can be overcome and be made good through such a person's actions relative to society. Hence, the lower right quadrant is defined by good over evil, or relative good over all. If the absolute value of why a collectivist individual driven toward morality by conflict embraces the idealism of martyrdom, then their values from the perspective of an independent individual will begin to approach those of the independent individual themselves, expressed as the absolute value of X. Here we see the relative value of X from the POV of Y and the relative value of Y from the POV of X combined to measure the absolute value of reality but that the absolute value of reality as a whole supersedes the combinations of X and Y as a total of an individual's perceptions by the amount of their imbalance one to the other determined by the ratio between their relative value to one another and their absolute value to themselves. The inner values of the independent individual, or the absolute value of X on the diagram, tend toward altruism over materialism. But because materialism is seen by the independent individual as evil, and altruism is seen by the materialistic collectivist as evil, then the lower left quadrant describing the philosophy of the independent individual X is labeled as evil over evil. Thus, we find the independent individual X becomes closer to the collectivist's individual values Y in a counterclockwise revolution around this model, while opposite this, the values of the collectivist individual, Y, become closer to those of the independent individual, X, in a clockwise revolutionary pattern around the model. Thus, if an independent individual begins from solipsism to embrace materialism, they will be approaching the values of a collectivist individual. Likewise, if a more collectivist individual embraces meaninglessness following altruism, they will have acquired the most independent-minded philosophical viewpoint, that of transcendentalism, which combines naturalist pastoral agrarianism, simple self-sustaining homesteading, and trance meditation. Transcendentalism is founded on belief in and study of the existence of natural laws greater than the individual's mental abilities to control. Where transcendentalism differs from solipsism 
is in the valuation of these natural laws. Transcendentalism values a harmonious ratio between natural laws and the interior realms of the individual's own mind, labeled psi, while solipsism, pursuing the concourse of meaninglessness, extends beyond natural laws to a point wherein the value of the collective from the point of view of the individual is negative three, an expression implying three degrees of uselessness and dystrophy. From this maximal distance away from the values of the collective, the independent individual X will only begin to approach the collective and share its values if motivated to do so by the needs of their survival. As needs tend toward becoming merely wants, as the independent individual begins to approach the values of the collective, survival tends more toward evolution. The angle at which the transition from needs for survival to wants for evolution occurs is determined by adaptation expressed as a diagonal from the intersection of survival and evolution labeled y equals positive 3, tending toward the intersection of natural law's existence with the interior subjective aspect of the independent individual, labeled x equals positive 2. Needs stray from a path determined naturally by adaptation from survival toward evolution due to belief causing needs to lead instead toward the individual becoming a producer of a good or service to offer as a benefit to society. According to modern economic theories, if one does not produce a good or service to offer for the benefit of society, one cannot attain the transition between survival's needs and evolution's wants. Thus, based on this belief, the individual next applies knowledge to the formation of their own craft to offer in the social market. Because the knowledge of society's requisite crafts and marketplace finds them to be evil relative to the good of the independent individual from their own perspective, the entry of the individual into the social market is considered the quadrant of evil over good. Motivated by a desire for minimum loss and potential future profits, the individual invests in their craft and enters the market. As the individual enters the market, they are guided first by knowledge in constructing their craft, but then by belief in the market itself. At the peak of market demand, we find the absolute values of X and Y are exactly equal to one another. Thus, at the pinnacle centroid point on the diagram, the values of X and Y cease being relative to one another, but that below this point, or to either side, they become relative to one another. As the minimum gains invested into the individual's craft, due to their belief in the market, approach the maximum profits level, the difference between demand governed by shortage and supply governed by surplus is measured as a diagonal from the core of the economic portion of the diagram labeled x equals zero y equals 1, tending toward the value, labeled x equals negative 2, of the independent individual from the perspective of society that is most aligned with the good of both parties involved, the good over good, wherein the good of the many and the good of the one are exactly equal. The role of the individual producer ceases here and is replaced by that of a group of consumers. As supply approaches shortage, 
due to influences on distribution and manufacturing in the industry of mass producing the goods and services designed by the individual producer as their craft. As maximum profits dwindles towards maximum costs, the ratio of surplus to shortage governing this trend is itself determined by the rate at which industry can manufacture a product and distribute it packaged to meet demand in the market. The ratio of supply to demand is the key factor in modern thinking on economic law. Economic law, like standard nutrition, the concept of unenforced law, or the deification of theism, are all constructs by the mind of the collectivist individual who values society most to conceptualize the nature of society's artificial laws. To the mind of the collectivist individual, the only thing separating an individual's craft that becomes an industry's product, labeled X equals positive 3, from the surplus group of consumers, labeled Y equals negative 2, is ability. Thus, the lure of advocating artificial laws less than the mind because they are products solely of human imagination is that by an individual's ability to conform and to influence a system from within, obeying artificial laws is justified by its rewards. As we descend into the mindset of a collectivist individual, we see that totalitarianism, a political dictatorship, is below artificial laws, less than the mind, parallel to transcendentalism, a naturalist philosophy, below the natural laws, greater than the mind, in the mindset of a more individualistic individual. Seeking meaningfulness and inspired by social heroism, idolizing public figures, the collectivist individual embraces the moral relativism of good over evil, or more exactly, the good of the many over the good of the few or the one. A collectivist individual who embraces moral relativism may yet attain idealism by the self-sacrificial act of martyrdom, the placing of the good of a goal, cause, or movement above the good of oneself. Now that we have looked at each of the four quadrants of this diagram and examined the complexity of its labeling within the intricacies of its skeletal framework, we may begin to have some understanding of how the individual, divided within themselves between the individualistic self-serving survivalist realism and collectivist altruistic utopian idealism, schools of thought that pre-exist the individual born into human society, functions relative to and interacts with their social surroundings. Within the mind of the individual that is equally influenced by individualism and collectivism is the perception of the absolute value of reality as a combination of both these values, expressed as X and Y. Looking back over the entirety of this diagram, we may also examine it as a method for measuring motion on a torus, or hypersphere. If the quadrants are taken as fixed location measurements of the values of the exterior over the interior circles, such that the interior circle rotates in the opposite direction as the outer circle, then from relative good over evil would follow relative evil over good, and vice versa, due to the dipolar magnetic repulsive effect of the opposed doubled values, good over good and evil over evil. Thus, the directions of motion indicated by the arrows in this diagram are based on the nature of higher dimensional topographic geometries being applied as a skeletal construct upon which to place labels involving individual interaction with society 
to better understand how and why such effects may be considered a valid comparison. While we can see that the individual's interaction with their social surroundings is depicted by the inner circle, we can also define how this value is extracted from its relation to the individual and placed into material reality as an existent object, the individual's craft, via this process. And we can see this process depicted by the upper circle that has the same diameter and circumference as the inner circle, but which measures the radius of the entire toroid model. We may thus understand the difference between an individual and their creative offspring or intellectual contributions, etc., is the same as the difference between the interior and the radius of a torus or fourth spatial dimensional sphere. Because the geometry of this model is based on hyperdimensional shapes and fourth spatial dimensional forms, we should expect to find similarities between it and other graphs or diagrams that are based on the same models or that use the same hyperdimensional four spatial geometries. If we examine the horizontal axis of this diagram, dividing the individual and their interior values below from the social surroundings and their value as reality above, we can begin to see how the one influences the other and how one guides the other along according to the same rules of motion that would influence the measurement of a torus diameter in four space or rather in the additional direction of time measured as motion. In the next section of this lecture we will be considering how this arrow of time measuring across the horizontal axis of this diagram as the diameter of a torus changes rates at varying phases due to the consistency of the medium through which it passes. For example, we can see that the rate at which the diameter progresses from y equals negative 3 on the far left center toward x equals positive 2 along the arc radiant labeled needs takes the same amount of time for an individualistic individual to accomplish as the distance from y equals negative 3 on the far left center to x equals positive 3 on the far right center for a collectivist individual to achieve by their ability to bridge the gap between y equals negative 2 and the intersection of manufacture with artificial laws. So, in this diagram, we will be examining only the horizontal axis, measuring the arrow of time as the diameter of a torus. Here we see that, where space is measured as a horizontal axis at a right angle to positive above and negative below entropy, the density of space is determined according to a lag in the distance traveled by various quanta given an equal duration of time. This pattern, reflected also in the solar plasma sheaths extension of penumbral EM coiling, reflects a lag or discrepancy in pacing of purely solid matter versus purely plasma energy and results in the accumulation of additional mass over density equals matter such that the otherwise more sinusoidal wavelength pattern here assumes a more covalent wave front akin to a phi spiral pattern. We see in this diagram as matter black arc left side of chart accumulates positive entropy, eventually it generates life, blue arc, which curbs the rate of entropy, followed by psi, symbolic of sentience, green arc, a very brief hyperacceleration of entropy, followed by the EM spectrum's purple arc center, decline, 
toward negative entropic zero point of C, the speed of photons in a void, followed by an increase through tachyons, C squared, the red arc, into ZPE, black arc on the right side, the points A through G should constitute a seven-note chromatic spectral scale. The points Roman numerals 1 through 6 are considered levels of clearance in the T4 program. As we consider this process more closely, let us look first at the left half of the diagram, below the label of light speed, along the lower marked bar as zero. We see that the first stage of entropic decay, to follow the division of the four elemental forces, one plankton following the Big Bang, the stage of fusion equals Earth, labeled in black on the far left, extends from negative nine units away from the speed of light at zero to negative six units away from light speed at zero. And this consists of an arc length of three units, while the arc length on the next stage, that of fission equals fire, in blue to the right, is only two units, and that of mind equals psi is only one unit. Now let us consider each of these varying elemental stages one phase at a time. We begin in the era governed predominantly by fusion and the coming together of matter to form stable atomic nuclei, attract electrons, form covalent bonds to create chemical molecules, etc. This stage of post-Big Bang era entropic decay, defined by predominantly the force of fusion, is associated with the terrestrial element of Earth because it was during this universal phase of elemental development that our own planet formed. Without fusion there could have been no solid matter and thus no Earth. The next stage of decay rates is fission associated with terrestrial fire as we will examine at the end of this lecture this entire graph depicts forces as they are governed by entropic decay, but this graph is only one half of the total picture. In the era of fission, rising prior to that of fusion, beginning to wane, the sun, our star, was formed. In the era of fission's decline and decay, the sun, our star, will begin to die. And this is where we find ourselves in historical times today. So we arrive at the location on this diagram, depicting our own present position as an evolutionary development toward sentience, constituted by mind and labeled by the Greek letter psi. However, how do we know that mind, or our own concept of self-awareness and sentience, truly exists. Its existence may be measured by how it impacts upon and influences the context it is placed into. For example, we might predict that due to the influence of the existence of mind equals psi on the series of elemental forces decay rates, the electromagnetic forces correspondent trajectory in this diagram's context would reach a maximum peak of positive entropy almost immediately following mind equals psi, but would then be caused by this peak to decay at an increasing rate as well, and we would not find the elemental force of gravity equals water occurring at all. Because the elemental force of electromagnetism equals air would be consumed into a vortex of dipolar, positive and negative entropy oriented perpendicularly at a right angle to the surface of this chart. Due to the influence of mind equals psi 
on the elemental force of electromagnetism equals air, we might expect to see the electromagnetic force as it approaches light speed velocities, the speed of unimpeded photons, spiraling around a zero point at C itself and approaching which by entropic decay into antimatter collisions and exotic particle cascades, the elements would decay at a much more rapid rate. In effect, the mind could cause the cosmic compositional elemental forces themselves to be flushed down the drain of time much faster. But we do not see this necessarily being the case in observations made of material reality. Instead, beyond the limits of even the force of electromagnetism faster than C, the energy of the electromagnetic equals air elemental force finally breaks form to cause the effect we call the elemental force of gravity equals water. But, as I said, the proof for the existence and the inner nature of the mind equals psi phase lies in the effect it has on its surrounding area. And we do not see the effect of mind equals psi warping the curvature of entropy plotted here so much that, at light speed, it would completely collapse. We begin again from fusion equals earth to proceed next into fission equals fire, and following from this we will next observe the peak point on the waveform curve occupied by mind equals psi. When we observe the indicated location on the diagram for mind equals psi as an elemental force of the cosmos itself, we can see it measures the same arc radian length as the second half of the force of fission equals fire would were it to continue down to connect with electromagnetism equals air in its negentropic arc. However, the elemental force of mind equals psi is somehow elevated positive entropically such that it crests at the peak of the wave of forces between fission equals fire and the electromagnetic spectrum of background radiations. In doing so, it connects with electromagnetism equals air at a point of greater positive entropy than if mind equals psi were excluded and the force of fission equals fire led directly into that of electromagnetism equals air. All of these aspects would seem to combine to indicate the influence on this model of some external additional factor omitted from depiction, causing the depiction to become warped or distorted from what we would expect it to be, an average sinusoidal wavelength over time. Therefore, for the elements of space-time measured on this chart, those about which the least is now known, gravity and ZPE, are projected with the least degree of accuracy as being such an average sinusoidal wavelength over time. Recall while examining this model that a standard sinusoidal wavelength is also a depiction of a sphere's equator between twin poles such as those depicted in this chart as the points of positive or negative entropy. Because this chart is only measuring entropy as the decay rates of various quanta of the four elemental forces, it is only a depiction of the Big Crunch era that follows the cosmos reaching a certain moment of critical mass, and thus this diagram is only showing us exactly one half of the entire picture we should be considering. In order to depict the first one-half of cosmic development following the Big Bang until critical mass was reached and entropy or time began, we may project this same model upside down and backwards to the model we have thus far considered in detail, and then consider, compare, and contrast how these models are similar or differ. 
To close the segment of this lecture discussing this model, I will offer the following diagram as Diagram 1, which will be a depiction of both the model we have thus considered and its inverse opposite prior to critical mass. Before the Big Bang, zero-point energy, the fifth element, was all that existed. When time began, the first force to form from ZPE was water equals gravity, followed by air equals electromagnetism, then by fire equals fission, and finally earth equals fusion, divided from ZPE, and space began, one Planck time following the Big Bang. This process is depicted along the upper half of diagram 1, and reads from right to left. Along the lower half of diagram 1, and reading from left to right, is depicted the decay of matter into energy due to entropy over time. The four elemental forces are shown as arc radians of increasing or decreasing amounts of entropy, such that in the same amount of time, each element will propagate only a certain distance relative to every other. In the given time, one Planck time, a quantum of the force of Earth equals fusion can travel three basic units, while in the same amount of time, a quantum of the force of fire equals fission can travel three plus two basic units, at least. In diagram one, the force of psi equals mind is predicted. In model A of diagram one, the predicted elemental force of psi equals mind occurs both on the lower, later scale and on the upper, earlier scale of elemental forces. Model A uses mirror symmetry along the lateral positive entropy axis to predict that psi equals mind occurs in the manner it does on the lower, later scale because it is reflecting an earlier precursor appearance of a similar force to psi equals mind, depicted on the scale reading right to left above. Model B depicts this concourse of the forces, one Planck time following the Big Bang, without the elemental force of psi equals mind being present during the period of original division of the four elemental forces from ZPE. Because there is no way to collect data from the period of time one Planck time following the Big Bang, when critical mass was reached and entropy or time began, almost the entirety of this diagram remains purely speculative and theoretical, a model meant to represent symbolically averaged rates of quantum decay given zero resistance. When we consider that this averaged sinusoidal wavelength, measuring the rates of quantum decay against zero resistance, can also be derived or decomposed from the chart depicting the individual of our species within our modern format of society, the question quickly becomes, what are quantum decay rates doing appearing in the middle of the diagram depicting human society? The answer remains simple, though elusive, like the breeze whispering through the leaves of the trees. It is merely a measurement of entropy or decay over time, and it is only altered as it passes through the phases described earlier in the first half of this lecture. The diagram of the four elemental forces is only a river, adapting to the terrain defined for it as the path of least resistance across the topology of the diagram of human society. The sinusoidal wavelength passes through the social model like the sounds of a song, in one ear and out the other, some being retained more, some being forgotten faster.